I guess now that we're recording, I will identify the fact that this is our annual uh, traditionally known pizza and pictures party for the Philadelphia chapters of this chapter of the Society of Architectural Historians. This is uh, February 1st of 2022, and we're welcome, uh, we welcome George Bryant to start us off. Thanks, George. Unfortunately, I can't get rid of this, this message that just popped up. Um, we cannot see it, so it's not. Oh, you can't enough. see it. Okay. No. Well, as long as you see the picture, that's fine. Okay. Well, I, you can't see me or Virginia, who's sitting here. And you, it's no loss to not see me, but maybe <laughs> to not see Virginia. Anyway, um, we keep going down to Mexico because our son-in-law lives there. Son and daughter-in-law. Daughter and we keep going off and seeing some fantastic uh, Mexican modern architecture. So um, this is, uh, I presented a few years ago, uh, buildings by all of these architects. So this is just some new buildings that we just saw this past year. Now I can't change the slides. Uh, oh, it's, it should work. I'm I'm stuck here. You may have to put the cursor on the image and then click. Try that. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. Well, this is just kind of the descriptive text. I'm not going to talk very much. You can just read the text. I hope you can see it. Um, anyway, we were down there at Christmas uh, uh, celebrating in Mexico for a change, and we visited a bunch of different two churches by Felix Candela and a building by uh, Juan O'Gorman, and uh, we went to this fantastic place, which is in Toluca. You always have perfect weather in Mexico City. <laughs> uh, Felix Candel, is, his stuff is just amazing. Uh, he was just all about thin shell concrete roof slabs. Um, this church is all poured in place concrete. And it must have been just amazing when they pulled all the scaffolding down and saw what it looked like inside. Uh, it's really an amazing space. The, the, his roof shells, he was able to get roof shells down to about two centimeters of maybe four centimeters thick. They're just amazing. Um, and this one has this fantastic uh, stained glass window that takes up just about half of the wall space. We stayed in this elegant house by Mario Pani. Uh, it was bought a few years ago by three women, one of whom was an architect, the other, another one was the owner of Yola Me Mescal, and another woman's an entrepreneur. They bought it to turn it into a um, bed and breakfast, and they added the addition you see on the lower right, um, which has two bedrooms and baths, and then there's two bedrooms in the original building. Um, but it's in a beautiful location and you can rent it. You can rent a room or a couple of rooms. It's very nice. It's in a great location. And the additions really works out very well and works well with the original building. This building is just amazing to go through. It has an incredible collection of Diego Rivera's uh, pre-Columbian artifacts. Um, and it's designed to sort of capture the flavor of pre-Columbian architecture. It's built out of this uh, volcanic stone. And the area behind the huge windows up on the second level uh, is a, a huge open space that uh, has a bunch of Diego Rivera's uh, 
cartoons for some of his murals. And it's like walking through a cave to see all the exhibits. And this is the Cosmo Vitreal Jardin in Botanica. In Hardin. Hardin, sorry, mixing my French and Spanish, in Toluca, which is just west of uh, uh, Mexico City. Uh, and it was an old market hall that they got, they couldn't figure out what to do with it and decided they'd put a botanical garden inside. And then this local stained glass artist covered the walls and most of the ceiling with these amazing stained glass windows. And as a plug for me, <laughs> just, just to let you know that my book is going to be published uh, next year. And that will do it. Well, congratulations on your book. Thank you, Virginia and George, for sharing your experiences with us. Um, we actually um, have a minute or two. If people have some questions, they would care to direct. Would you be willing to see, to have someone sure. ask you something? So is would anyone like to unmute themselves and uh, ask a question? George, this is Veronica Oplins. I'm curious if you can tell us what your book is about. Uh, it's about uh, Hen Henry Holiday's stained glass windows in Gilded Age, New York. Um, he designed over 50 windows for in New York State and city. And uh, they're some of his best work. Um, so uh, Lund Humphreys has agree agreed to publish it and it's off the manuscripts off to the publisher and it's gonna be 300 and some pages long with 300 illustrations, mostly color. Um, so I'll tell you when it comes out. <laughs> Thank you but, very much, uh, looking forward yeah, to it. Yeah, keep your eyes open for it. That's fabulous. I wonder if um, the buildings that you chose to show us, you chose because of their amazing stained glass in addition to the other aspects of the building that you mentioned. Well, not exactly, but they just happen to be there. They're not actually this sort of stained glass that I'm very much a fan of, but they were nonetheless quite striking and amazing. So and very photogenic, so. Absolutely. Any other questions? Can you tell us a couple of buildings in which the Henry Holiday stained glass show up in New York City? Oh, yeah, there are um, the, the Church of the Holy Trinity up on the Upper East Side is has a complete set of 17 uh, Henry Holiday windows. Um, St. Luke's Hospital has a really spectacular window in their chapel. Uh, Grace Church has uh, maybe, I think, five uh, Henry Holiday windows. Uh, and Church of the Incarnation has, uh, I think, five windows. And there's a few others scattered around. There's some in uh, Flushing and Brooklyn and Queens. Um, uh, really fantastic ones are up in Utica. Huh. So there's there's a lot of them, um, but most of them are in New York City. Thank you. Um, is the Upper East Side Church on 88th Street between um, Second and First Avenue? Yes. Aha! Uh -huh. I used to go there. Yeah. Thank you. I will look at it. It rang its bells every day at the quarter of hour when behind yeah, our it's, house. It's a beautiful church. And the, uh, the Victorian Society actually holds their lectures there now. Interesting. Very interesting. Yes, it's, I have to look harder the next time I'm visiting New York. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. I, um, I guess we can move on to Bruce Laverty. Bruce, I have, um, well, I thought I had, 
I have so many emails from you, Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> I'm having a hard time seeing where's the one with your presentation. Do you ha have it handy, or should I keep looking? Keep looking. Yeah. Or if you want, if you want to, if you want to skip ahead of me, that's fine. Because no, I don't, I, I don't have it on my computer here. Okay. At home. Let me see what I did with it. Oh, okay. So oh, you... here it is. And so I'll just let you know when to advance the slides once you get, we great. get going. I, uh, it's in a Dropbox, so let's see what, um, oh, I guess this is it, Portraits of, a, of the City, right? Right. So let me move it over here and go back here. I will share my screen. How's that? Great. Okay. Uh so as, as a counterpoint to the all that luscious uh, uh, polychromatic uh, stained glass that, that George just uh, uh, gave us as a as a uh, as a great appetizer, um, I'm shifting us to uh, I'm shift, shifting us to black and white, and uh, using this opportunity to put a plug in for an exhibition uh, that officially opens tomorrow night uh, at the Athenaeum. It's actually been on the wall for about two weeks um, with a soft opening, uh, and uh, the title of the uh, the exhibit is the same as the title of a of a book um, that was written uh, by uh, Jerome Lukovic, uh, the, the late uh, Philadelphia photographer uh, who um, died uh, fairly suddenly uh, back in 2018 uh, while, the, uh, while the book was in production. Uh, the book was uh, published by uh, Oscar Riera Ojeda uh, Publishers, who's, who's done a number of architectural, uh, uh, architectural things, and it really is, uh, really is, is quite, uh, quite luscious. Uh, so the, uh, the exhibition will be open at the Athenaeum free uh, through, um, uh, through April 4th, uh, but on this Friday night, which is our first Friday when we're, we're generally open to the public anyway, uh, we're going to have uh, Willie Williams, who's the, uh, uh, the professor of photography at Haverford College, um, uh, moderate a conversation with Sean O'Rourke. And uh, Sean is a practicing architect here in Philadelphia, and uh, he wrote uh, essays to accompany Jerome's uh, photographs. Uh, and um, uh, while the book itself is not a catalog and, and Sean's uh, essays are, are not captioned, um, they, uh, they are inspired by Jerome's photographs, uh, but not driven by them. Uh, and uh, uh, as remarkable as Jerome's photographs are, um, uh, Sean, uh, Sean O'Rourke's essays uh, are, are really uh, quite, uh, quite remarkable as well. Uh, and so I, I strongly recommend that you, you uh, give a chance to, if you have a chance to stop by, uh, order, order by the book. Um, Sean will be doing a, um, uh, an evening of readings of some of his favorite essays from the book uh, on February 17th at the Athenaeum. Next. Now I will see, can I forward without downloading? I don't it know. Looks like maybe not. I'm sorry. This is oh boy. Okay. Okay. There we go. <clears throat> so uh, while you're you're. you're... Okay, so while you're doing that, uh, Jerome uh, Lukovic was actually born in Iowa, uh, and he studied at the University of Iowa uh, as a, uh, a major in English and communications uh, in the late 1960s uh, and early 1970s. Uh, he came to Philadelphia uh, about um, uh, in, the er in the early 19, um, uh, 1980s uh, and actually shifted uh, careers and became a commercial photographer uh, doing uh, commercial work as well as portrait photography, that is uh, portraits of, of people. Uh, and while he was doing that, uh, uh, it, he became a sort of a standard uh, presence. Uh, some of you may remember the uh, the Foundation for Architecture's Beaux Arts Balls, uh, which were an annual uh, event um, uh, for the uh, the architectural glitterati of, uh, of Philadelphia of the late 20th century, uh, and Jerome took portraits uh, of, of uh, the attendees uh, in all of their fine costume uh, there. But as as a personal avocation, uh, he began to uh, he began to uh, point uh, point his camera uh, at uh, at things in the in the city. 
and we're here we're having a very quick walkthrough <laughs> so yeah, sorry about that uh, no that's all right so uh if we if we uh take a look at uh at city hall here so you see uh, a lot of traditional uh photographs of of traditional uh, buildings in the city and you think well there's there's a photographer who um you know is is doing a uh, you know a recent take on, on an old uh on an old theme um and so we have city hall here next slide And then you know here here we have the Drake uh, you know in in all of its splendor and you think well you know it's a wonderful uh, it's a wonderful piece but you know we've seen that before picture the picture could have been taken uh, in 1929 when the building was new um, what's new and different about this and uh, if we go to the next slide one of the things that um, uh, that Jerome did was manage to capture. Um, uh, very, uh, very familiar buildings from uh, unfamiliar or somewhat surprising uh, uh, settings. Um, so this, uh, this pr particular viewpoint, which I used uh, as our, uh, our poster uh, image for the show, uh, shows, the, uh, shows the Drake Hotel uh, with the Kimmel Center in, in front of it. Uh, and uh, it was taken from uh, Cypress Street, which is that small street uh, just below um, just below Spruce, uh, and the cross street there in the front of uh, uh, in the foreground there is 13th. Uh, so he's looking up an alley uh, towards uh, towards the Drake, and has this wonderful juxtaposition uh, of uh, of buildings there. Um, there is uh, a building that has since been built on the east side of Broad Street, uh, so that uh, if you looked at the same view today, this photograph is probably from around 19, uh, from, from around 2002. Uh, if you looked at the same view today, um, you wouldn't be able to see the Kimmel Center uh, at, at all. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, another idea of perspective, we, we've seen lots of, of, of photographs of the Art Street Methodist Church and of Vincent Kling's uh, Municipal Services Building, uh, but a, a great sort of tunnel vision view looking down um, uh, Kling's uh, concourse there uh, towards, uh, towards the 19th century building. And he, he's clever enough to get just enough of that underpass, uh, which you can see uh, that leads to the, the parking garage uh, underneath there uh, on uh, on Arch Street. Uh, but, uh, but a view uh, that maybe many of us have walked by but hadn't uh, quite taken advantage of. Next. And of course, here we have the Rittenhouse Plaza uh, over at 19th and Walnut Street, uh, looking uh, looking up in the wonderful framed uh, archway uh, of the Price of McClanahan building. Next. Here we have uh, the uh, John Wanamaker building, uh, and uh, he really loved to frame things so that the, the pattern of the brickwork uh, playing off of the uh, reflection of the glass uh, and the rhythm of the, uh, of the round arches above um, um, provides movement to uh, a rather, uh, rather conservative, uh, conservative building otherwise. Next, please. Uh, and here's uh, here's an interesting view. Uh, that's at the top of the uh, of the uh, of the art museum steps. Uh, and uh, rather than looking at the main body of the art museum or looking out as uh, as as hundreds of thousands of uh, photographs do, uh, here we have a, a well uh, the the horse's rear end image, uh, <laughs> so to speak, uh, of the um, of the colonial rider. I'm not sure. Uh, I'll in the Q and A. I'll ask somebody. If they know who that is, I'm not sure who it is. But it, uh, it's not uh, it's not so important on who he is, uh, but the uh, the angle that it's taken here. And you, if you look closely in the lower right hand corner, it almost looks like he's pointing his lance at that vehicle, which probably shouldn't be parked there up on top of the uh, uh, on top of the plaza. Next. This is one of my favorite uh, images in the show. It's a it's a view from the uh, from a Wanamaker's department store, looking at the Cunningham Piano Company building uh, directly across the street, uh, and uh, and and you just it's the building is a is a fairly narrow and tall building to begin with, but uh, he really hammers that point home uh, with this uh, with his view that sort of draws us up uh, heavenward there. Um, so there's the Cunningham uh, building in its in its narrow facade. And next, 
here we have the Cunningham building uh, in its in its uh, larger flank. Uh, and who knew that the the that the the Cunningham building actually had relief letters uh, on the side of it there? And he juxtaposes it beautifully with the Willis Hale, with Willis Hale's Hale building there uh, at the corner of uh, at the corner of Juniper and uh, and Chestnut Streets. Next. Just as with the uh, Cypress Street shot of the uh, of the Drake and the Kimmel Center, this is a, a, a view of the 1400 block of Chestnut Street. Uh, you see the Jacob Reed store there in the, uh, the lower right, uh, uh, the William Price uh, uh, store uh, for the Jacob Reed's men's store, which is uh, uh, later in life was a CVS pharmacy. The building in the middle is Frank Miles Day's um, uh, American Baptist Publication Society. Uh, and uh, the uh, the plaza in the in the front uh, was actually the site of the um, uh, the Fidelity Mutual Tower that had burned and then was demolished and, and there was a, a vacant lot there for many many years. So this is looking south from what would become Dilworth Park, uh, and it's interesting because at that time Dilworth Park was Dilworth Plaza mo and mostly granite. Uh, the uh, the parking lot is now a building, uh, and uh, Dilworth Plaza is now a park. But if you look, if you shot, if you put your camera at the same angle, you wouldn't be able to see uh, anything but the side of the uh, uh, that that new tower that has gone up there. So um, uh, there's a moment in time where you capture visions of uh, of the city uh, that um, that are fleeting, even though the buildings may may remain. Next. I'm not sure who Lois was, but this uh, this uh, was, uh, I guess, her place a place to meet. He uh, did uh, not just look at uh, landmark buildings in Center City, but he took his camera throughout the city and looked at buildings in all kinds of shapes uh, and uh, and uh, and styles. Next. Many of you are familiar with the Crane Arts Company building, which is on the left uh, on American Street in North Philadelphia. Uh, the mural is gone, uh, but uh, for the longest time, a, uh, uh, the wing of that building on the north side uh, uh, had a, a, a wonderful mural of a, of a white goose. Next. Uh, here's a great uh, image of um, a row of houses uh, east of Kensington Avenue on Lehigh Avenue, um, where the, when the houses were built, um, they were at grade level. Uh, and they lowered the grade of Lehigh Avenue to accommodate uh, the railroad tracks uh, uh, and accommodate uh, um, overpasses for the, the railroad, which is directly across the street from here. The thing that I'm amazed about uh, about this uh, uh, about this treatment um, when they lowered when they lowered the houses, they built these really rather grand uh, staircases uh, for them. I mean, they're they're intimidating in that the, the number of steps that you have to climb to get to your own front door. Uh, but um, uh, they really did. Uh, you could tell that they spent some time with the design uh, of those staircases um, for what were relatively uh, modest houses. Next. And here is a, a lone survivor. Uh, it's a house on uh, Wing of Hocking Street in what was known as the Logan Triangle, uh, an enormous uh, neighborhood uh, that was demolished uh, about uh, 30 years ago uh, because it was built on the Wing of Hocking, uh, Wing of Hocking Creek Valley uh, and on uh, the Wing of Hocking sewers that failed uh, primarily because the, the fill that they used was made out of coal ash rather than uh, um, rather than earth and 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 uh, steady earth. So so um, but uh, the, again, uh, you know, he he not only captures the loneliness of the survivor, but frames it perfectly, you know, with these uh, with these street trees uh, as well. Next, here is a supermarket building. Uh, I. You know, if Bob Venturi were still around, I think that he really, <laughs> really would have enjoyed uh, the message uh, of this. Um, you can read the evolution of the of, of the building and the change of the neighborhood uh, from the different kinds of uh, of uh, meat products that you can uh, and poultry products that you could have gotten there. Uh, this building is still there. It is on. Uh, Gerard Avenue on the north side on the 600 block. Uh, a lot of that signage is gone, but the building itself is intact. Next. 
one of his great artistic uh, um, uh, photographs is, is this um, uh, power station on Willow Street, the Philadelphia Electric Company steam generating plant, uh, which um, uh, shows um, a, a wonderful uh, in industrial complexity and, and uh, the natural formation of the clouds directly ahead. Next. Here we have the Witherspoon building at, at Broad, uh, at, uh, well, it's at Broad and uh, uh, Walnut Street, um, actually J Juniper and Walnut Street, uh, built for the Presbyterian Board of, uh, of uh, Sabbath, uh, Sabbath School Publication. They, they, they printed Sunday school, um, Sunday school programs for uh, the entire uh, nation, Presbyterian nation, uh, designed by Joseph, uh, Joseph Houston. Next. Many of you who've taken the L uh, into uh, into North Philadelphia have, have seen this. This is the Harbison's milk bottle. Uh, this is a water tank that was uh, uh, associated with the Harbison's dairy. Um, this is one of three of these water towers that uh, that were in Philadelphia. Uh, there was one up around Kensington and uh, Erie Avenue uh, at another one of the plants and uh, one around Ninth and Hunting Park. Uh, and um, when I was a kid, those were those were decorated. They were those were painted uh, red and white to look like a, look like a milk bottle. So it looked like a, a, a full bottle of, of Harbison's milk. So what goes good with milk? But a Chick-fil-A sandwich. <laughs> and again, a, a question of scale here. Uh, one can imagine the captain of the SS United States uh, pulling up to the drive through and saying, uh, we'll have 7,000 Chick 7, Chick-fil-A specials, uh, some uh, with lemonade, some with Diet Coke. Uh, but uh, a, a great uh, a great view of some what are some of the absurd uh, uh, perspectives uh, that we have right on on our own doorstep. Next, and I, that may be it. That's it. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I, again, uh, we, we're having First Friday uh, open house on uh, this coming Friday at uh, six o'clock. Um, we actually will be open uh, all day until uh, six, uh, and that's when the when the program starts. Thanks, Bruce. That was terrific. I'm sure there might be one or two comments or questions people would like to pose. I have two questions. Hi, Betsy. <laughs> two questions. Uh, was he using a view camera for these? Uh, I know that most of the photographs were taken between about 1998 and about uh, 2015. Uh, and so he, he was making the transition from, uh, from traditional photography to digital at that time. So I don't know whether he was using a view camera uh, uh, for, for them or not. Uh, after he passed away, his estate gave the Athenaeum his archive. Uh, and so we have about 300 prints um, made from various sources. There's about 1,500 digital files. Uh, almost all of it is black and white, but there may be about 50 or so uh, color some panoramic work that he had done uh, and uh, and and probably about 3,000 four by five negatives black and white negatives wow. so semi-processed but I, so I, I don't know but I, I can ask Sean or you can ask him yourself when you come <laughs> when you come to one of our programs oh I'm coming for I definitely want to see that Great. show my, my, my other question is do you know where the lowest building was do you know if that that location was in the book which which building? Oh, Lois. Yeah. Uh, I I could. Uh, uh, it, it's in North Philadelphia. I can get you an address. Shoot me an email tomorrow, and I'll I'll get it for you. I will do that. Thank you. Yep. Love it. Great. Okay. Well, I think we're lined up for Pierre next. Pierre, you sent me your presentation, so I have it here on my screen. Um, would you like me to control the slides, and you'll just tell me when to go? Sure, that would be fine, David. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Can hear you very well. Okay. Uh, while you're getting that up, I'll just say that for the benefit of everyone, I've been continuing to research the life and work of Walter Horseman Thomas, uh, architect, Philadelphia architect. Um, and I had one major accomplishment since I spoke to you folks last, um, and that is that I published a Wikipedia page about him. So if you look him up uh, on Wikipedia, you'll see uh, a fair, a reasonable summary of uh, many of the uh, documents that I've been able to uh, clearly identify relating to him. Um, and recently I've also been 
concerned about the life cycle of buildings. One of the homes that he built in Rydal in 1909 was demolished. And um, I've been thinking that, unfortunately, that's the end of a lot of buildings of various periods. And um, there's one that I had been looking at. Go ahead and put in the next slide. Um, hmm. For a while, which is a beautiful church in North Philadelphia on 16th Street. And um, it uh, has been uh, in pretty severe neglect recently, but I did have the occasion to actually go inside and I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, it actually, its life has been fairly well documented. This is a sketch that appeared in the 1913 AIA exhibit catalog. Um, and you will see ultimately that it was pretty much built like that. Uh, go ahead to the next one. Um, and fortunately, the construction was very well documented. This is from the Episcopal archives. You can see uh, the mason has dropped off several loads of stone and they've started building the walls. Uh, go ahead. And of course, they have to lay a quarter stone. It's a, an important building. Uh, go ahead. Um, the steel structure is very interesting. This is not a typical church. There are no side aisles. Um, it's a church for the deaf. So the point is to have perfect sight lines for everyone in the sanctuary to the platform. Uh, so there are no columns, it's a clear span. And here you can see the, the structure of it um, pretty clearly uh, as it's under construction. Um, go ahead. And there's the finished uh, sanctuary in 1914. Um, it's a very simple space, uh, very beautiful. The tower itself is not rectangular. It's actually um, trapezoidal so that there are no hidden corners in it. Uh, it really is a, a, a very charming little church. Uh, next slide. And uh, they had some very generous donors. And I'm a, uh, sorry these are not in color, but these are the old photos of the uh, stained glass windows. Um, and there were quite a few of them. I can't tell exactly how many, um, but uh, anyway, we'll see some in, in a later slide. Go ahead. And this church actually served the deaf, deaf Episcopalian community in Philadelphia from 1914 to roughly 1968 uh, when the diocese moved um, the um, deaf uh, services down to St. Stephen's on 10th Street and they closed this church and sold it and so it has been struggling ever since. Next slide. Um, and you can see nature has gotten <laughs> a hold on the building although the tower um, is still there and, it, and it's pretty robust. It, it's going to take a heavy ball to, to knock it down. Um, next slide. So during the pandemic, I stopped by one time just to take some more photographs and a uh, car rolls up behind me um, and this very distinguished looking gentleman with a clerical collar gets out and I go over and talk to him and I say, you know, I really love this church. It was designed by my grandfather and I realize it's not in very good shape, uh, but I'd love to, uh, you know, get to know it a little bit better before it, it crumbles. And he says, oh, well, I'm the pastor and, um, and we're gonna tear it down and build a new church because I own the property behind it. Um, so ultimately he let me in. We had to unscrew about six sheets of plywood and so forth and so on. And you can see it's a little bit the worse for wear, but the, the sanctuary is still there. Um, it still has some uh, feeling of a church. Next slide. 
the um, roof structure is in amazingly good condition considering how much the rest of the building is um, challenged. There are bits of the stained glass windows still there. Um, next slide. Uh, the, this is the connection between the sanctuary on the left and the parish house on the right. Uh, and you can see that there's been pretty serious water intrusion. So there's very significant structural issues. Um, and I think that is it. Um, so anyway, the, here's a, a brief um, run through of the life cycle of this particular very charming little church. Um, a little bit over 100 years. And thanks for your attention. I'll take any questions if there are. Are they going to save the windows? What's left of them? I, I don't know. Um, I, I was wondering about that. And I actually spoke to the pastor. And um, I suggested that they may want to reuse those. Um, um, to put it politely, they probably are not culturally very relevant for his uh, uh, services, but uh, I'm sure they were made by some significant artist of the time. There's probably people that would like to salvage them. Yes, and I hope that they would salvage, there are probably many other items within that uh, building that could be salvageable yeah what what is the cross street it's at 16th and what it's just north of allegheny okay thank you yeah and i haven't i haven't stopped back in the past six months so i don't know if it's still there or if it has been demolished yet here i had a an observation and a question yeah when you're looking at a 20th century church, you often wonder if there are some signs of modernity that differentiate it from 19th century revival churches. And there I see, I don't know if anybody calls it this, but kind of segmental pointed arches, you know, whether that gives the whole thing a kind of low rise without it being a four centered arch. And it, it really consistently holds that profile everywhere. Mm -hmm. The question was, uh, when you were looking at the trusses that hold up the roof it kind of looked like we were looking at wood trusses but then the photograph made them look like they were steel they are uh is the interior photograph that you showed showing the steel or is it clad in wood it's clad in wood uh -huh. yeah yeah the um i can't say that i am any kind of authority on style <laughs> to Jeffrey to, to address your earlier question, but it does look a lot like, uh, to me, like churches that Thomas would have been very familiar with in France and England, particularly of the Roman style um, and the Norman style, so-called. And yeah, the, the roof is in beautiful condition uh, or the the ceiling on the inside is in beautiful condition, but the steel is clad in wood. Hmm. Yeah. Here, when I saw uh, that uh, that rendering that you uh, uh, that sketch that you first showed, uh, it uh, the massing of it made me think of the uh, the Overbrook Presbyterian Church out on City Line Avenue at mm -hmm. Lancaster with mm -hmm. that with that uh, uh, you know heavy stone tower uh, face forward and of course the, uh, out on City Line it's on a sort of a forty five degree angle to the intersection but um, um, it, you know and I would imagine that would have been about the same about the same time. Um, Overbrook Presbyterian, you're saying, Bruce? Yeah. City Line yeah. of Lancaster, yeah. Yeah, well, actually, Thomas lived about a block from there at the time. Oh. So <laughs> he would have seen that. Church. It was inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he was actually a member of St. Paul's, which is another block down the road. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, there are probably a lot of, I have not analyzed the, the style that much, but it is um, a, a very charming little church 
you know, a compact building with the parish hall attached on the back um, and the main entrance on the side. Thank you so much, Pierre. That was really fascinating. I look forward to your future discoveries regarding uh, Walter Thomas. Thank you, everyone. Um, next up is Veronica Aplank. And uh, Veronica, I don't believe you shared your images with me. Is that right? That's correct, David. So I'm sorry about that, but I'm prepared no. to share my slides myself. Yeah, I don't need to, I don't need to be the editor. So that's great. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen and watch the clock. And uh, I am happy to present to you, so thank you. Um, so I'd like to take us uh, from the United States and from an urban setting uh, to Central Europe, to Slovenia, which previously think just south of Austria, former Yugoslavia, and also to rural landscapes. This image of the central uh, part of Slovenia, it's called the Gorinska region, uh, is, presents a, a typical sort of a landscape that we see uh, often on postcards. And definitely if you uh, Google Slovenia and look up Wikipedia, this is from the central Gorinska region. It's a high tourist uh, area, very popular, very photogenic. Uh, the houses that we see are in a small village. This is Buhinska Bistrica, uh, very typical vernacular architecture of that, uh, of that, of that region, you know, large home, uh, what we would say is two stories, uh, flowers on the windows, uh, peaked roof for this alpine setting, traditionally a lot of snow. And it's very easy to imagine these places as, as quite picturesque, quite provincial, quite vernacular, perhaps not modern. Well, uh, what I would like to argue is that there's a great deal of modernity here and there's a, a mixing of the modern and the traditional in some very interesting ways. And if I may be, uh, to quote uh, the wonderful David DeLong, if I may be a bit of a pig, I, I have a book coming out on this soon. And so I'll be happy to talk about that at another time. But let's look at the rural areas for now. So uh, this is a similar rural area, uh, a bit uh, north and west of the place we just looked at. This is uh, the Yezersko area, the, the peak of the, um, of the, of the uh, mountains that you see. If we were to just look left, we would be right on the Austrian border. And this is what a lot of Slovenia looks like, um, particularly in the central area. So geographically, it's about the size of New Jersey. Its population is about 2 million. And uh, it historically has been made up largely of very small towns. And we can argue whether there's any cities there historically or not. The capital has about uh, a quarter of a million people. Uh, and so this is quite a small place, I would say, and largely rural. So moving forward, um, Slovenia is today an independent country. Uh, it became that with the disintegration of Yugoslavia in 1990-91. Uh, prior to this, um, uh, you, Slovenia was part of Yugoslavia, which first formed after the First World War ended in 1918. And then it was reincarnated, we might say, at the end of the Second World War as a socialist country. Um, and so with the on introduction of socialism, uh, there was a great push for the modern and for the new. Uh, and so we can all think of the Stal what, what my friends call Stalinist architecture, you know, big, concrete, modernized, urban, industrial proletariat. And architects at that time were very, very busy talking about how to introduce the modern, both as a style uh, for buildings, also in planning for uh, plans for towns and for the overall shape and layout of towns, and also for the countryside. So this 1953 issue of the primary journal, uh, translated, it would be the Slovene Architect. Here, if you look on the lower left-hand side, we can see a, Alpa, a rural landscape that looks a lot like the ones we've just seen uh, in the previous slide. And here in this, in 1953, we can see that this is something that they are debating. If we look on the left-hand side above that rural landscape, in the middle of the page, we see a sketch. And that's a sketch of a hay rack. 
And if we look at the very top of that uh, page on the left-hand side, we, we're looking through a hay rack. And that's a very typical, iconic, Slovene agricultural outbuilding that uh, we'll look at later too. Uh, and so continuing in this, um, uh, in this journal uh, of the Slovene architects, uh, we can see that there are, is an entire article do, devoted to the Slovene hay rack, uh, which is in Slovene is known as Kuzots, with its various forms. The form that we see on the left in this very sort of striking um, uh, photo, uh, stylistically pleasing photograph, and we can see mountains just behind. Uh, that's the typical Slovene hay rack. Uh, on the right, we see other, uh, we see variants. Now, uh, moving to 2013, um, if we <laughs> go to the Slovene landscape uh, in the central uh, uh, Gorinska region, we see that here in the, in the village of Buchinska Bistrica, much of, the, of what the architects were talking about in the 1950s is still quite present. If we look uh, past the tree in the middle of the picture, we see a Slovene hay rack. And if we look to the right of the tree, we see something we wouldn't expect in a post-socialist landscape. We see a wayside chapel. And Slovenia is actually filled with wayside chapels and they're one of my very favorite types of vernacular architecture. Um, they often hold this form. So it's a, um, a peaked roof with uh, some sort of a panel and it could be a single panel as we see here with a crucifix hanging or it could be a four-sided panel as we're going to see in a moment and then standing on some sort of a pillar, some sort of a something. Uh, if you look to the right of that wayside chapel, uh, we can see uh, a farm building just where the road bends. So this type of wayside chapel is something I'd like to take a look at. And moving forward in a different part of Bohinska Bistrica, which is quite a small village, we see a very typical wayside chapel. Again, it has the peaked roof, it, this one is a freestanding building, and so it has four sides, uh, and it's standing on some sort of uh, something. So here it's standing on um, uh, something, of a, uh, something of a pillar. Uh, you may not be able to see it very clearly, uh, but on the right-hand side, we can see something of a gate uh, on, on, on the, that face of the chapel. Behind that gate, there'll be a statue, often of the Virgin Mary with the Christ child, uh, villagers will put uh, candles there. Um, there's a very particular type of candle that's encased in a uh, in a in a closed case that uh, that allows for airflow. And then on each of the other sides, there will be a picture. And so on the left uh, face that we see, uh, I believe that's Saint George killing the dragon. Now, if we move to another uh, village area um, here, this is Kamniška Bistrica, we see a wayside chapel. This is, also, this is a chapel that's bigger than the one we saw previously in Bohinska Bistrica. This one is actually something of a freestanding, very small church. And so it's really moved out of the wayside chapel, small monument, and more into the category of a church. And the interior is quite beautiful. If we look uh, at the front facade, we see what they call the monogram of Mary um, there at the, 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 the peak of the pediment, and we see the mountains beyond. So we've been looking at these chapels and uh, where they're called wayside chapels. And of course, chapel makes one think Christian. In this area, this is of course the, um, uh, in the reach of the uh, historically of the Catholic church and Slovenia is, is historically Catholic. Now, for a bit of um, political background, that's necessary to understand what happens in the next slide. You know, throughout communist Europe, the church and the communist state had differing types of relationships. So for example, in Poland, um, the communist, uh, the, the communist uh, state was opposed to the Catholic church and the Catholic church was really a, a political actor and quite broadly espoused by the population. In Romania, uh, the communist state had something of, a, of an understanding with the Romanian Orthodox Church. And for example, uh, many Romanians were baptized even though they were living in a communist state. Now, Yugoslavia was complicated. And in brief, uh, as you know, there are, there are uh, two major religions, uh, Christian and uh, Muslim. And there are two major Christian churches, uh, Catholic and the Orthodox churches. 
here in Slovenia, uh, during the Second World War, there was tremendous fighting between, uh, speaking very broadly and very simply, um, the fascist who the fascists, so the not the Italian fascists and later the Nazi fascists who occupied Slovenia during the war, and uh, the communist partisans. And there are individuals, there were individuals in the Catholic Church who aligned themselves with the with the fascist occupiers. So speaking very simply, at the end of the war, the Yugoslav communists and the Slovene communists were very opposed to the Catholic Church. And so, for example, unlike Romania, not everybody is baptized. So now let's look at these church forms. And now let's look at a very early socialist monument from the 1950s. First, we're going to take a reminder. This is a Marian column from the 1600s. Also a well-known, again, a reminder of the form of this type of a wayside chapel. A peaked roof, a cross at the top tells us this is Christian, um, a pillar standing on some sort of a pediment, wonderful uh, flowers and um, uh, candle in the front. And here we are. <laughs> what are we looking at? This is a wayside chapel, right? It's, it, a path leads up to it. It's, it's just past the freestanding chapel that I showed two slides back. But take a look at this thing. At the top, there is a star. That's the communist star. That's not a Christian cross. If you look, there's a peaked roof with three roofs. I make the argument that this roof is, this peaked roof is a reference to a communist symbol of three, three triangles drawn in this shape. And that's a reference to the Slovenian mountains and a reference to the communist uh, liberation movement during the war. So let's come closer. We see a, a plaque and it's and translated, it says, um, dedicate, roughly translated, dedicated to the fighters, the mountaineers who fell, meaning who died in a wartime setting um, in the fight against fascism, you see the word fascism in the middle there, uh, was, uh, was, this was erected in memory uh, to them by the um, local uh, Alpine Society, 1946. This is right at the end of the war. And this is right during that very brief moment, uh, those brief years until um, 1947, when Tito, Yugoslavia was closely aligned with the USSR and we can argue that there were some elements of socialist realism in Slovenian architecture, or here I would say in the monuments that completely disappeared later from all of the landscapes. So here, if we circle the monument, the, this photo was taken in uh, 2014 and it's, it's not clear. And even then it wasn't very clear, but we see instead of saints, we see communist fighters and at the bottom, <clears throat> I'll use my um, uh, cursor if you can use it. This figure here is a communist fighter. And behind him are communist fighters as well. We see a face, we see a face, and we see a face here. Now let's go to the next slide. Here, this is a difficult figure to see, but if we look closely, and again, it was weathered in 2014, this is a man with his face down, with his arms tied to a, a, a stake. And I believe he's an individual who was executed. So again, a memorial, this isn't, this isn't a well-known saint such as St. Florian, St. George, whom we often see on the traditional monuments of wayside chapels, but it's a communist fighter. Now, these sorts of monuments are extremely interesting. The monument that we just looked at is the only monument stylistically of that kind that I know. But this Slovene landscape that we see here that looks so very picturesque, so very calm, so very non-political, if I can say that, so very rural and uh, vernacular and perhaps so simple, it is actually filled with different types of monuments. And some of them are sacred as the ones we saw in the first few slides dating from the 1600s all the way to today. And there is an array of secular monuments dating from 
at the end of the First World War forward that cover this landscape and that, re that reflect its history and that together create an extremely interesting and rich cultural landscape that I think sometimes can escape our view. And so for that reason, I wanted to bring it to your attention today. So thank you. Uh, and I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions. Veronica, this is Paul Steinke, and I'd love to ask you a question. Uh, I'm a quarter Slovakian, but I've never been there, nor have I been to Slovenia or one of these days. But I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the concept of wayside chapels. Uh, and I wonder what was their function? Are they like God's phone booth? Uh, are they oh. single use occupancy? No, 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 Paul. That's how, do very they, how do they work? <laughs> well, wonderful. Well, Paul, it's great to see you and thank you for the question. So let's uh, bring our attention first to the US vernacular landscape to find a reference point and then let's return back to the Central European landscape. Here in Philadelphia, Philadelphia, we often see sneakers hanging from some sorts of lines. Um, and that we can say is a type of a informal memorial or marker. Now, what those sneakers represent, I have heard fellow, fellow folklorists debate extensively, um, whether it's an accident, whether it's a major event, or whether it's just somebody wanted to throw up their sneakers. But it's a memorial, and that's my point. It's a memorial. We're also familiar in this country with memorials bought alongside a, a street or a road, particularly in the unhappy cases when someone is killed. So it let's, for example, in a, in a car accident. So these wayside chapels that we have seen have often been erected uh, to uh, thank uh, a particular saint or the Virgin Mary for a particular event, for a particular what was seen as an intercession. You may remember the that uh, 17th century 17th century large stone wayside chapel that I erected. Those are often called Marian columns because they were erected to Mary. And they, you find them throughout Central Europe, including, um, I know particularly in the Czech case and potentially in the Slovak case, to thank the Virgin Mary for a town having successfully survived the plague. So these chapels are erected to uh, honor a saint or the Virgin and often in thanks. The sacred monument, these are sacred monuments. And we might find them at, at a particular, like for example, in a field, uh, so a farmer may erect it. We may find them on a building. So for example, a, a cross that hangs on a building, even a very large cross, the size of a chap, you know, a, a wayside chapel. Or we may find them often at the intersection of roads. This, this uh, secular monuments that I talked about that date from the socialist period are often found in all sorts of places and often generally where there was a battle. Okay. So, and the, you could enter them and uh, uh, thank you for that question. So, no, you can't enter them. Oh, uh, okay. I saw. I thought I saw a door that you could walk in, walk through. So, the one chapel I showed is actually a small chapel where church services right. are held. The okay. majority of wayside chapels are 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 one uh, are monuments that you can walk around. Got there it. may be a, like a door with a gate that villagers may have a key to and they can put uh, ca candles within and then relock the door, but they can't be entered. Okay. Well, thank you, Veronica. That was really fascinating. Now I want to go to Slovenia. And I, <laughs> well, I'd be delighted to show you Slovenia and Paul, um, Slovakia. I love hearing the, your pronunciation of the language, which I assume you can speak and read. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. uh, Slovakia is a wonderful place and I encourage you to go there as well. Thank you. Veronica, I wonder if, um, uh, What's the what's the preservation situation in uh, Slovenia regarding these kinds of uh, I don't want to call them ephemera. Some of them have lasted for a long time, but these these mm -hmm. smaller structures, small scale monuments. Well, David, thank you for the question. It's a great one. So uh, preservation in Slovenia began in the late 1800s and has basically continued um, uninterrupted to today. Uh, today, there these uh, what I'm calling a wayside chapel, uh, has a particular name, it has a name, a term associated with it. And historic wayside chapels are entered into the database of the 
local, that is the state, they're equivalent of the SHPO, they're the State Historic Preservation Agency, and they are sometimes um, renovated and cared for by the state agency. Uh, these types of small scale monuments that exist in villages are often cared for by a particular village because it is their monument in some ways or on their land. Um, uh, I also will add that um, uh, the sacred, these are the sacred monuments. The secular monuments are cared for as well. And I wanted to add a final point. We started out with looking at the vernacular landscape and we saw a number of hay racks, right? So hay racks, clearly the name signifies what it's for, farmers dried hay on them. You know, these days, almost no one dries hay on a hay rack because it's a tremendous amount of work. They are iconic to the Slovene landscape and have been known on the Slovene landscape since a 1689 um, spectacular encyclopedic description of Slovenia. Those are disappearing uh, with the, the conversion of land for essentially strip mall and big box stores. Some have been converted to like basically into billboards, but those have in say the past 10 years really fallen into a much greater state of disrepair than I saw previously um, when they were in use, for example, in, even in the socialist period. Wayside chapels are in a better condition. Thanks, Paula. I, I see you're, you're looking I, to ask something. Just a comment and a question. Um, this kind of wayside chapel is very, very familiar to me from traveling in Greece, where they're extremely common. Uh, I was wondering, well, you said something about who builds them. In Greece, they're very often built by a family or a village dedicated to a local saint. And they're typically used about once a year on the saint's day. So I'm wondering if these wayside chapels, whereas I'm not, I've spent a lot of time in Italy and I'm not aware of this phenomenon in Italy. So I was surprised to hear that some of these are Catholic. I'm wondering, rather than Orthodox, I'm wondering if this is a, a larger Balkan phenomenon. Slovenia is a new country, obviously. I wonder if these, this kind of monument is not restricted to Slovenia, but you know, wider Yugoslavia and even uh, Greece. That's a great question, Paula. I believe that the, these types of monuments are across Yugoslavia, although I know the north of Yugoslavia best. And I know that they are across the former Habsburg lands of former Austro-Hungary. So I've seen them in Hungary. Uh, I've seen in the, in the Western part of Hungary, particularly freestanding crosses with topped with roofs. Uh, that might be, let's say, the entire monument, let's say, will be the size of a man or taller than a man. So I've Catholic seen rather than Orthodox. Correct, correct, Catholic. I've seen them in the Czech part of, well, in the Czech lands or so today in the Czech Republic, which uh, historically was Catholic Protestant, but very much secular in the early part of the 20th century. Certainly I've seen them in Croatia, which is historically and still continues to be Catholic. Um, I would say, so, so um, the saints days and the veneration of saints is slightly different between, in, between the Catholic church and the Orthodox churches. But broadly, I would say these exactly as you've described in uh, Greece, there's a very similar situation in Slovenia. Uh, these chapels are often built by a particular village or family, again, often to commemorate an event. You know, the, the village was saved from burning, so the, the, the chapel will be or is dedicated to St. Florian, for example, um, who protects villages and houses from burning, from fires. And then the, these, they're visited uh, and attended to, I believe, throughout the year, but especially candles are lit at certain, um, at certain times of the year. So in particular, that will be, um, that will be uh, what it, we here call the Day of the Dead or All Saints Day. So that's uh, November 1st. Um, it will be on Christmas. So that for them, that's uh, the December 24th. It will be on Easter. And I haven't seen it so much on the Saints Day, although in the calendar year, every saint does have a day associated with that saint. And David, I've seen you drop in the chat that you've seen some in Bavaria and in Italy as well. Yeah. So I think, 
I'll just add what's interesting about these is that they're not just a freestanding piece of architecture, they're very much used and integrated into community life. What's the oldest one that you know of? Oh my goodness. Well, the oldest one that I can recall off the top of my head is from the 1500s, but I, I'm, I'm thinking I've heard of ones from the 13 or 1400s, especially uh, including Marian columns. So that's a column with the Virgin Mary on top and it's dedicated to the Virgin. Very, very interesting. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, are there more questions? Jeff, were you about to ask? Yeah, um, Veronica, I, I was, I, I suppose it's, it's quite easy for anyone framing a picture of a chapel against the mountains to make it seem this way, but I was struck by kind of, uh, maybe you're internally channeling Vincent Scully, but I was thinking of the, the Pueblo churches echoing the mountainscapes behind them and, and kind of creating a, an indigenous tie there um, in uh, the Southwest. But it also seemed to be the case, and then I was blown away by the idea that the communists had appropriated the same imagery as a kind of validating imagery. Yes, well, thank you for that, Jeff. I mean, I, it would be, it's very flattering to think that I'm channeling my inner Vincent Scully and I'll go ahead and accept the compliment. I will also say that that valley is so narrow that you can't photograph the chapel without capturing the monument, <laughs> the mountains too. I will just add just, I'll try to keep it to one sentence that um, the preservation of monuments and the preservation of the natural landscape, the history of those two fields goes hand in hand and the legislation goes hand in hand. And it's about, you know, the seeking of the, it's related to the seeking of the, the, the soul of the nation and the history of the nation and rooted it both in land as well as in architecture. Um, I think the appropriation by communists is, fan, is fantastic and amazingly interesting. And I just want to say that this particular monument that I've shown you, I was so absolutely taken by, taken by it. Uh, whenever I would go to this area with my father who was a mountaineer, so we would be here a lot. I insisted that we photograph this thing <laughs> because I have not seen any other monument in Slovenia that has this sort of overt, what I will call socialist realist, type of imagery and icon iconography. Um, most of the uh, secular monuments that are dedicated to communists, first of all, the landscape both in cities or and in towns and in rural areas is absolutely strewn with them. And they are usually a very nondescript monument. And I think this appropriation of the chapel form is just, is absolutely mind blowing. Um, and it, it's my fantasy and my dream to write a, an article on this, on this monument because I don't know that it's been studied. Really terrific. Thank you so much, Veronica. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more about this someday. Um, and good luck wrapping up your book. Um, so Paula, you are uh, up next and I have your... Um, PowerPoint um, already on my screen, but if you would prefer to show share it yourself, we can do it that way. No, go ahead. I'll okay. <coughs> sorry, I'll tell you when to switch. Perfect. Okay. So once again, Thomas, you Walter. So I'm sure most of you know that uh, Thomas U. Eustach Walter is best known as the architect of the United States Capitol Dome. Now, in November 1860, when he was living in Washington, D.C. as architect of the Capitol, Walter wrote a letter to an admirer who had requested a list of his buildings. And as ever, I have to thank Bruce for uh, calling this letter to my attention. In reply, so the, the letter from the admirer does not survive. What does survive is Walter's reply, in which he has sent a list of 50 buildings, presumably those he considered uh, his best works. Among the civic buildings, churches, and other well-known projects, Walter included three mansions in Philadelphia. Next. 
The first was the house uh, for uh, James Dundas, for many years prominent on the northeast corner of Broad and Chestnut Street. So notice that this house was 20 years old when um, Walter included it in his list. Next. This was followed immediately by the um, uh, splendid mansion of Matthew Newkirk. I, Bruce, I'm sorry, I stole this from the uh, at the name website, which by the way, was a directly across the street from the gigantic house that uh, Walter built for himself in about 1839-40. Now, the third, the third uh, mansion in this list is the mansion of Jacob Levy Florence. Now, if you're like me, when I first saw this name, I said, who the heck is that? So I immediately ran over to Bruce and said, who's Jacob Levy Florence? And he didn't know either. So I started in on my research. Next, the, the uh, Florence house is recorded in great detail in Walter's day book from, the eight, from 1848 and uh, 18, uh, 49. Uh, he first, it's first mentioned in this notation up above, uh, where uh, actually uh, there's an earlier notation, uh, March 22nd, 1848, when uh, he lists, he records that he received $10 from uh, Jacob Florence for a rough sketch for a mansion. Several weeks later, by April 22nd, he handed over uh, uh, plans of four store, uh, plans of four stories, an elevation, uh, a full size detail of a console, and 19 pages of specifications. From this point, for the from this point on until April 1849, when the house was. Uh, either completed or close to com completion, Walter records 57 entries relating to the Florence mansion. These include payments for additional drawings, mostly of details, including, for example, a drawing of the centerpiece for the parlor ceiling, a drawing of a mirror, uh, mostly concerned with the, um, with the windows, uh, and doors of the facade. He spent a lot of time on the console of the uh, of the 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 top of the main door. So, who the heck was Joseph Levy Flo uh, Florence? Next, please. Uh, this is the basic information that I've been able to round up so far. Florence was not a native Philadelphian. He was actually born in Charleston and moved to uh, New Orleans as a young man where he was in business. He actually founded a hotel, the Florence House Hotel, which he ran for the next couple of decades. He was established in Philadelphia by 1841. He was, uh, his new house, he brought his family to Philadelphia a couple of years later and his, was residing in his new house on Chestnut Street by 1850. By the way, his brother William also lived, uh, moved to Philadelphia about the same time and lived on a house, lived in a house on Rittenhouse Square. I might also add that in the 1860 census, Jacob Levy listed assets of $250,000, which I think think is pretty substantial for that um, period. So where was the house? Next, David. 1520 Chestnut Street. And this is what it looked like in the Hexamer Lochner map of about 1860. The main thing to notice here is that it's noticeably larger than other mansions, adjoining mansions, but certainly larger than the nonetheless substantial townhouses on the rest of Chestnut Street. Now, as luck would have it, next please. 
An insurance policy survives taken out by Florence in 1850. Here's the sketch plan of the ground floor of the house. Not, not terribly informative, but um, it did have four rooms on the ground floor separated by a generous hall with the service buildings to the rear. Uh, two kitchens, there was actually a bath. By the way, the house had all mod cons. It had two furnaces in the basement. Uh, it was heated by hot air. It had, uh, it was lavishly decorated according to the uh, insurance policy. And by the way, it was so lavishly decorated with frescoes that the insurer refused to include those in the insurance policy. They wouldn't, in other words, they wouldn't cover these uh, especially expensive interior decorations. Now, what's unusual about it uh, are two things right off the bat. The first is this, what the insurance sur survey calls a cross passage. And although there are no doors here, I assume that it was accessible from the main rooms on the ground floor and also communicates with the service buildings behind. I probably look at, just by flipping through insurance books from this period, I've probably looked at several hundred sketch plans of houses. And I've never seen this before. This was 25 feet long, but only six and a half feet wide. So it's a, it's a service corridor, I think. So if anybody has seen anything like this, I'd really like to know. I wonder if it was something uh, introduced from New Orleans, that it was the patron who asked for it because it was something he was familiar with. The second strange thing is the way the service wing is shifted to the east, leaving this, it's labeled passage or alleyway, which communicates with the cross passage. I mean, uh, the lot that the house was built on extends all the way to Sansom Street where Levy owned a, a stable. Now, normally I would imagine that, you know, deliveries would be made through uh, Sansom Street, the back of the alley. What this was for, I have no idea. And why they, he was willing to give up, I forgot how wide this, um, alley is at least um, 15 feet. Again, I've never seen this configuration in any insurance policy. Uh, so of course, I was hoping to find a picture of the house, one form or another. And sure enough, next please. I found this in the scrapbook of Helen Perkins. It's a print pasted into the scrapbook. No, uh, no date, no other identification about where it might have come from, although it doesn't look like it, it was published in a newspaper. Um, it, around 1870, the, the political club, the Reform Club, was founded in 1872, and they bought the mansion about that time or shortly afterwards. Uh, to me, it doesn't seem to do the house um, justice, but so who knows? I know there's no um, commercial panorama of the 1500 block of Chestnut Street. I'm right, Jeff. Am I right, Jeff? Uh, so I'm just hoping that uh, something more uh, informative might show up. What, what I did find, uh, well, let me just say, the final entry that Walter made uh, concerning the Florence house is dated July 28th, 1849, and it reads, wrote description of Florence's house for John Lindsay. John Lindsay was the contractor. And lo and behold, what turns up a few weeks later? Next. This anonymous <laughs> review in the North American on August 1st, uh, so 
Walter wrote his description on July 28th. On August 1st, this was published I, and I excerpted it. It's not really much longer. And I think this is the description that Walter himself wrote, perhaps at the request of the contractor. What can I say? The praise of the building is fulsome to say the least. It preeminently commands the admiration of all advisors. Uh, it is richly ornamented, highly finished bra brackets of a novel and tasteful form. Uh, the cornice of the building is bold and effective, adds greatly to the beauty of the front. An air of elegance and cheerfulness pervades the whole establishment. As I said, unsigned, but <laughs> is this a, a unique example of Walter publicizing his, his uh, own work? So far, I don't know of any other um, examples. He was certainly, if it is true that he uh, wrote this, and I, who, who else could have written it? Um, he seems to have been extremely proud of this house. Which, uh, did I mention before the, um, could you go back, David? Yeah, unlike the, well, I shouldn't say that. The house is actually of brick, but it was coated in that uh, popular material, mastic, which was a kind of plaster. And it was painted, uh, I presume, white in oil paint to simulate marble. And all of the uh, window surrounds and uh, uh, other features were uh, actual marble, which was Why, did David, did you mute me, David? Uh, we, you, we lost your audio for a few seconds there. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Anyway, so you can see, I mean, this uh, cornice doesn't seem to live up to the description that Walter gave in, uh, in his article, but he spent days and days on the sculptured over door with its, with its brackets of an unusual and novel kind. So as I said, I'm hoping that uh, one of these days, maybe a stereo, uh, stereograph photograph will turn up. In any case, this is an example of what you can do in the in the digital digital age. You know, if Bob Ennis had been able to uh, use newspapers.com, he no doubt of he no doubt would have uh, discovered this. But in the meantime, it's still possible to discover. Uh, significant buildings by well-known architects through the resources of the internet. And that's it. Bravo. Um, any comments or questions from the audience? I'll ask, I'll ask a quickie. Uh, Paula, wonderful, wonderful stuff um, and information. So uh, I gather you were not able to discover anything about uh, his occupation once he moved here, or maybe he was wealthy and didn't, well, you need, know, in, didn't need one. In a one city directory in um, New Orleans, he's listed as a grocer. Oh, interesting. Which you know, probably doesn't mean a grocery store. It probably means a wholesale grocer. Uh -huh. He also ran this hotel... Uh, in New Orleans. His father was a dentist, believe it or not. Uh, but in all of the, um, in the three censuses that he appears in in Philadelphia, he's described as gentleman, which okay. I take to mean independently wealthy and not actually working. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Just managing, managing his portfolio. Managing his wealth and building a grand house. Right. Paul, I was wondering about the plan and trying to fit it to that front. That is, is, is the gap there? The Did, plan, yes. If, if you look at the, uh, the Can image- Can we go of, back, David? Yeah, I'm, I'll try. Here we go. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I, uh, I'm looking at it. How come you can't see it? <laughs> As I said, whenever I want to, whenever I look up an insurance policy, I flip and I've looked at dozens. I flip through the whole book just to see if there's anything interesting. And I've never seen anything like this. Yeah, it says passage or alley. The insurance surveyor doesn't even know what it is. <laughs> I mean, would you pull your carriage up or something? But he had a carriage house on Sansom Street. Hmm. Why would you sacrifice that valuable Chestnut Street frontage? Well, it's funny because right just to the left of this is Colonnade Row, the, the last bit of Colonnade Row. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe the uh, the passenger alley was a little bit, was narrow enough to be represented by that little break between Colonnade Row and the mansion. Then why shift the service wing to the east? Oh, could you go back one, David? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... I mean, Walter also hmm. designed Colonnade Row. Am I right? Oh, I see. I see. Ha Haviland. Haviland yeah. designed Colonnade Row, even oh. though it's not according. Well, anyway. Oh, I see. It was much. It was much narrower than it looked in the uh, the hand drawn plan. Yeah. That little. But even so, what does it do? What's the? Oh, you know something. Uh, I'll have to read this more carefully, but. Um, Florence sued his next door neighbor. I think it was the house to the east. Let me, I don't want to bother to look for it now, but um, he sued one of his next door neighbors. Paula, we've lost you. Uh, sorry. Right, I'm going to. Sorry, I don't know what to do. Oh. We can hear you intermittently. Mm, problems with the sound. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Well, I um, I think you leave the audience hanging. That's always a good lesson, right? <laughs> keep us, keep us waiting until the next the next uh, episode. Um, sorry about the technical issue. Um, yeah, I think it's an internet connection possibly. Um, so um, I think we probably should move on to uh, our next speaker, if that's possible. Sorry, Paula, that I know you probably had a little more to add there. No, you're, you're great. Well, thank you. That was really, really fabulous. I really think everyone got their money's worth tonight. Um, Jeff Cohen, you are... Um, you are scheduled to go next if you are still interested in sharing. Sure. Great. Uh, shall I do it myself or do you want to do it? Um, I, uh, if you have it handy, that would be great. Otherwise I can look for it. Okay, I, I, I have it handy, I think. Okay, you should be able to share with no trouble. Okay. Great. You see something there? We do. 
Oh, cool. Uh, actually, I just wanted to say, Paula, that that was that was terrific, and uh, you're right, a fulsome a fulsome description. We'll get we'll get another bit of fulsome description in a sec um, of a remarkable house, but. Uh, about, I don't know, sometime last summer or so, uh, Aaron Wunsch and Sandra Markham and I went and looked at a house near La Salle on Worcester Street um, by James Peacock Sims that got me more interested in Chestnut Hill and Germantown. Uh, and you can see this article, which I'm sure you all read when Lippincott's magazine came to your house in 1884, um, on New Germantown and Chestnut Hill. And indeed, there was a New Germantown uh, happening about that time. Um, and this very perceptive article that I think was written by the editor, a guy named John Foster Kirk, I think, um, just celebrated a remarkable range of inventive architecture. And he immediately identified it as a Queen Anne style. You can see it, I hope, underlined there, uh, mentioning a lot of architect designed houses in an unusual kind of situation where even modestly fronted houses were designed by some key architects, really making a kind of rich density of, of the new Germantown of the 1880s that is really what I found fascinating. Um, one of the illustrations in this is of this pair of buildings. Uh, do you see over here, Clement Williams? Um, and here it is in a perspective from Mariana Van Rensselaer's uh, 1886 series in Century Magazine called Recent Architecture in America. You know, a really amazing shingled uh, pair of houses. And then here's a drawing of it. And if I zoom in real closely, it's by McKim, Mead, and Bigelow before Stanford White gets partnership. But if you look closely down here, do you see a little SW right there? Stanford White made the rendering. And who knew there was a Stanford White in such a, such a location? Unfortunately, it was demolished in the 1930s. But this was just one of many places in Germantown and the Lippincott's article mentions places like Walnut Lane and uh, Green Street and uh, kind of the epitome, epitome of it in uh, Schoolhouse Lane, but whole blocks that are like this, you know, with different architects doing the different buildings. Um, we know these were done by uh, George Hewitt over here a couple uh, several weeks ago, Mike Lewis, uh, had suspected that this was a Willis Hale by the look of it. And then our little uh, village of nerds, of architectural nerds uh, was able to figure out that, it's, that indeed it's credit is the Greg, the Greg House designed by Willis Hale, uh, but just was never given a location um, in the citation. So, you know, Hewitt's, Hale's, this one, you know, over here looks uh, for the world like, uh, you know, uh, a George Pearson who was maybe the most prolific of these architects. But designing for the upper middle class or even close to a middle class uh, in an economy that you might think of as an economy of architectural identity, where a lot of people could afford an architectural identity and hired an architect to do it. The epitome of it was, of course, uh, Schoolhouse Lane and just throwing some pictures along this real gallery, uh, kind of a, a kind of a, a, a murderer's row, as they call the 1927 Yankees, of really remarkable individualized buildings designed by professional architects. And we can look forward to David Briner's work on this um, because it's, it's really a, a great rich setting. Um, but what brought me into all this is this pair of houses. Um, it may not look like a pair of houses, but if you look over here, there are two fronts. And this was designed by this architect, James P. Sims. Um, that's him over here. And the drawing down here, you can see it was uh, delineated by Wilson Eyre, who at this point was somewhere between these two ages. This is him at age 11 in Florence. And this is him uh, about age 35. So somewhere in between those two in his 20s is Wilson Eyre making the drawing for Sims. Um, and it's kind of a remarkable performance. If you look at it carefully, you see that the two fronts are over here and he's just putting everything he can into the flank of this thing. And it still exists very much like this. These are the two houses for the Sin brothers. And then here's daddy's house over here. But what really caught my eye was if you go just down the hill, 
there's a huge house over here. I'll show it to you in a. Here Jeff, may I interrupt a second? The audience yeah. is asking if you could maximize your image so I think people could see it a little better. Sure. Thanks. Think, Does that do it? Yeah, that's better. Well, let me see if I can get the faces out of the way. Oh, maybe you can't see the faces. Um, but uh, do you see this house over here at Y? Here are the two Sin Brothers houses uh, by, by J uh, James P. Sims. Here's Daddy's house. And then just down here is the house of William Rutch Wister, uh, who was really the local Tyro. You know, he was a lawyer. He was, uh, he owned half the, he, they, he'd married into the uh, Peel family. Uh, and so he owned lots of land, you can see, with the Worcester family over here. And he was really tied in well to what seemed to be one of the key social dynamics of Germantown, which was cricket. This is that house. And for years, I'd been thinking, you know, there's so many, it's, it's like a gallery that all the, the labels have fallen off the pictures. Um, but there's just a lot of inventive architecture in Germantown. And I thought, one of these days, uh, I'm going to go look through the Germantown Telegraph and the Germantown Independent and see if they mention any of these. And indeed, they did. Uh, kind of the, the third page I looked at from February 1876 said, one of the finest houses ever erected in the lowest part, the lower portion of Germantown has just been completed for William Roch Wister. And it's 49 feet square of Germantown sandstone of English Gothic architecture. And I, starting, I was starting to suspect that this might have been uh, the work of the Sims brothers. And indeed it was. It's credited there, 28,000, which is about you know, uh, 20 times the cost of an average building. And it was amazing. This is from the description. Let's see if I can get this out of the way. Passing through the main entrance, a commodious hall presents itself, which opens into two parlors, dining room, reading room, and other apartments. Finished in butternut with open fireplaces laid and surrounded with decorative tile. The dining room, a well-proportioned apartment with a southern exposure is finished in walnut. And then they go on to, this is what they call the third story because the first story was exposed at the back here. Um, the third story, uh, I'm saying the third story into the commodious English hallway with an open fireplace, a large obscured and figured glass window with ornamental border is an attractive object. The hallway lives to, this hallway leads into spacious chambers finished in oiled wood, having dumb waiters, speaking tubes, etc. So that's that story. And then the fourth story contains a number of neatly finished rooms with a wonderful view. And then the basement has the kitchens that are also uh, warmly praised. So this is Henry Sims working with his older brother, much older brother, 17 years old. Uh, Henry Augustus Sims, who will die in 1875, just a year before the building is finished. That's James Below, and that's their more famous building that most of you might know of at 22nd and Spruce, the, uh, the Trinity, Trinity Chapel uh, that they worked on. Uh, looking at family history, there were some wonderful letters from Mother Sims to young James. Uh, and I like this one about... Uh, I feel glad for your sake that you have been successful, successful in playing cricket, but I pray you to keep your love for the game in its subordinate position it ought to hold. Maybe you've all got letters like this from your mother at some point. Uh, and then he said, now is not the time to take another term, half term at the university, nor idling in Henry's office, this is Henry, but to look around for a business opening for yourself. And then she talks about he had almost come to marry a woman named Maggie, was, they were, um, in 1873, they were engaged and then she died. But then mother scolds him. Uh, she, as she was young and beautiful and accomplished, the probability is that she would never have waited for a poor young architect to get well enough off to marry her. On that moving. Mm -hmm. And then Sims himself, like his brother, dies really young. He's aged 33, dies suddenly. This is from a Lancaster paper and they mention that just at the time of his death, he was the director directing the building of Peter McConomy's new mansion at the corner of Charlotte and West Chestnut Street in Lancaster. Uh, and so it's time to take a road trip to Lancaster. There it is. It's now a law office. 
it's it's got a wonderful stair hall over here and above this angled fireplace over here is this plaque of 1882 the year that sims died so that's what i wanted to share with you thanks Any questions, comments? See, you're getting a lot of accolades here. Uh, Jeff, I was what caught my eye was a comment that said no paint was used either inside or out. So I imagine that means wood paneling on the inside. Was there also any evidence of possibly tiled interiors or other materials used? In the description, they did mention tile, but I think I think at this point, Sims was very much a goth, uh, and his brother was as well. And you know, they were being very true to material. Although they, their way of you know, uh, kind of playing with it a little bit is to have a different primary wood uh, exposed in its col natural color mm -hmm. in each of the major rooms. That was certainly true of a lot of the houses on Schoolhouse Lane, where they, the fire insurance policies make it very clear which room has which kind of wood. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Terrific, thank you. Um, and uh, I think we're, we've got Greg Pritchard um, lined up to conclude the evening if he is still, if he has enough energy to present. Are you ready, Greg? It's been a long day and I uh, just got out of a long meeting, but uh, I'm really glad I was able to, to make it. Um, so thank you. Sorry, I missed uh, most of presentations this evening, but um, look forward to watching a recording if there is one. Um, yeah, we, we, I was requested to record and I did. Everyone agreed that they would be okay with that. So there will be uh, a recording available. And in fact, uh, just as a reminder, a few weeks ago, I finally was able to upload Paula's uh, talk from last fall onto uh, YouTube. So if you um, haven't seen it yet, if you weren't there for the original presentation, please uh, check it out on, on YouTube. And, uh, and this also will eventually be available. So Greg, uh, I don't remember if you sent the presentation to me. Uh, well, I do have it on my screen. I'd be happy to share it. That's that, okay, that would be terrific if you could. No problem. Okay, well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so my name is Greg Pritchard. I am a historic preservation planner at Lower Marion Township, where I get a front row seat to see this building. And that's where I will start. Um, so this is a kind of a preemptive memorial address about an unloved local train station. Ardmore Station is about to be demolished after 65 years of service to the community. Uh, pictured here in 1970, and yes, it's uh, less than 15 years old in this picture, um, there's no secret that it's nobody's favorite transit station, more of a reminder of the once mighty Pennsylvania Railroad's fall from grace. Even Stuart Saunders, PRR president from 1958 to 1963, who lived a short distance away, insisted on being chauffeured by car to his office downtown. Maybe it was because he actually hated trains, or maybe, like most, he hated using this station. <laughs> what the station replaced in 1957 was a true landmark of Victorian era PRR architecture. This 1873 station, um, located across the tracks on the outbound side, was designed by Joseph M. Wilson and Frederick G. Thorne just a few years before they started their own firm, the Wilson Brothers Company, along with uh, Wilson's Brothers, as the name, name implies. Uh, the PRR used architecture to great effect to enhance the public perception of its business, culminating, of course, with Frank Furness's expansion of Broad Street Station in the 1890s. Its uh, suburban stations were smaller expressions of the same overall vision. The old Ardmore station served the community well for 84 years, but fell out of favor when appreciation of Victorian architecture waned and 
uh, the land on which it sat became valuable for redevelopment. PSFS Bank redeveloped the site after a series of concepts like this one, envisioned by their architect, Josephat Plater Zyberk. His daughter Elizabeth is today well known, a well-known architect and planner who is one of the founders of the new urbanist movement. Now, on the other side of the tracks, however, the PRR envisions something far less interesting. These are the original blueprints for the long tan brick building that was built to replace the Victorian landmark Ardmore Station. The uh, PRR seldom gave architects credit, especially in the 20th century. And uh, perhaps in the case of Ardmore, nobody wanted to take credit. Uh, here's the Lower Marion Township permit application for the building where the architect is simply identified as PRR. The seal on the plans is signed by Clarence B. Diltz, an architect based in Lansdowne, whose independent work is not well documented, though he uh, also signed the plans for Paoli Station, which is of a similar uh, design and materiality. So where did the aesthetic for the simple brick station originate? Oddly enough, it can be traced back to the highly stylized work of industrial designer Raymond Lowy. His design office was on retainer for the PRR, designing everything from locomotive cladding to trash cans. The firm also devised new paint color schemes for all of the PRR's suburban stations, even the ones from the Victorian era. Lowy's firm had many separate offices, including architecture. One of the architects best known for his work at the firm was named Lester Tishy. Fortunately, Tishy was not uh, left as an anonymous cog in the machines of a large corporation or design firm. His designs on behalf of Lowy for the PRR stations were uncharacteristically promoted by the railroad and his name specifically was highlighted. Two of his stations were featured in the Architectural Forum in March 1943. Those were Edgewood, Maryland and Ridley Park, Pennsylvania. However, he might be best known for a later work of, uh, that made, uh, for a later work um, that he made for the PRR after he left Lowy's office, the ultra modern clamshell ticketing area on the floor of Penn Station in New York City, undoubtedly inspired by the airport designs of the time. Because of that station's well-documented demise, it was in existence for, or the clamshell specifically was in existence for less than a decade. So I decided to visit some of Tichy's uh, remaining works last summer. I started close to home and here is Ridley Park, which still retains a large amount of its integrity and 1940s flavor. You may see some direct similarities with Ardmore Station. It is a masonry box, although made of stone, with a flat roof sloping gently toward the back that also serves as the platform shelter. Incidentally, Ridley Park is probably best remembered by railroad fans for its former station, unique for having been built on a bridge over the tracks. Now the same basic box design with a sloping flat roof form was replicated in Tishy's Edgewood, Maryland station, though its exterior of, was of red brick and stained wood, and unfortunately it no longer stands. The second station of his that I visited is Aberdeen, Maryland. It is of a different overall form than Edgewood and Ridley Park, and it retains many of its interesting details. Included on the site are elements like these structures over the tunnel steps with roofs that uh, um, resemble kind of birds in flight. And of course, its modernist lettering is another great feature on the chimney. Now this station, which is served by Amtrak and Mark, which is uh, Maryland's uh, transit agency, is not the only historic train station in Aberdeen. Just a stone's throw from the Tishy Design Station is a remarkable survivor of the Victorian era. It is one of Frank Furness's last surviving suburban stations from a group of standard plans that he designed for the BNO Railroad. A community effort has been raising money for several years and now is finally making progress saving and restoring this landmark, which uh, ceased being used for passenger service generations ago. 
And so now we end where we began in Ardmore and a conceptual rendering of what will take the tan brick station's place. So if you'll be passing through Ardmore within the next few weeks, just take a look and look beyond the aesthetics or lack thereof of the uh, current station and remember its place in the history of the Great Pennsylvania Railroad and the ever evolving form of train stations everywhere. Thanks very much. Thank you. I'm, I'd be glad to hear some questions or comments. Greg, who's the architect for the new station? That I'm actually not sure. Um, it's, uh, it's been in the works for uh, quite a long time and uh, um, I'll, I'll have to get back to you on that. Is it through Amtrak or through SEPTA? Yeah, it's through Amtrak. Um, it's uh, actually both an Amtrak and SEPTA station. Um, Ardmore and Paoli on the main line are served by both um, agencies. And um, yeah, it's, uh, um, it's, it's quite a project. And it's, uh, like I say, it's been in the works uh, for a couple of years. They just opened a, um, a new platform on the other side of Anderson Avenue, which um, uh, probably for the first time in about a hundred years, uh, passengers are boarding the train on that side of the road. Greg, have there been any voices in the community in, in favor? Uh, maybe it's too late, but are any, any people praising the mid-century station that's about to be replaced? Not that I've heard. Mm -hmm. No, it's, uh, you know, it was never really a very functional station to begin with, um, it's very utilitarian. Um, it had uh, kind of a style of its own, but um, I think uh, everyone was ready for something different there. So it's it's worth appreciating uh, now for what it is, and uh, um, and we'll we'll see how well the new one functions in comparison. Mm -hmm. Ray, it's interesting to hear you say that because it's probably more or less the same words that were used to describe the Victorian era station when the Tishy station was being proposed. Probably true. Um, so it's just yeah. funny to think about how uh, tastes change, but uh, I applaud the steps that the township is or the Amtrak and SEPTA are taking. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Well, um, speaking for myself, this was really a fascinating evening. We heard a, a huge variety of topics, all carefully. Um, presented and um, I think uh, to a receptive audience. I um, encourage everyone to check our website, check your email, um, and uh, you'll see what programs will be coming up in the next few months. I um, have uh, started reaching out to people by email if they are uh, have not um, paid up on their dues. Uh, at this point, I think it's now time for us to send paper letters because obviously some people may prefer to communicate that way. So if you see a letter in uh, your mailbox, in your three-dimensional mailbox in your house, um, please um, read it and, uh, and rejoin. For those of you who are paid up in your dues, thank you for, for maintaining that membership. And uh, please spread the word. If you know of anyone who would be interested in joining us as a new member, we would love to have some new members. So please uh, don't forget about that. And um, I'd like to sign off by thanking everyone who's contributed and attended tonight. So thank you so much. And Veronica, thank you for assisting with the um, um, managing the, the evening. So um, we will see you all soon. Good night, everyone. Thanks, David. Great job. Thank you.